Okay. Good morning, everybody. Again, this is Adam Goldstein, Chief Business Officer, Federal Home Loan Bank. Um, we welcome you to today's webinar on this uh, lovely morning. Um, as we did last year, we plan to continue to offer educational sessions to our members to help support you and your strategies as we all kind of muscle through this, uh, this difficult pandemic that looks to be coming to an end. Uh, we bring you these sessions uh, every other Thursday, hosting a range of speakers, uh, both from the Federal Home Loan Bank of New York and outside experts like today. Uh, for example, next uh, webinar, we're going to have Ben Plotkin, Executive Vice President from Stiefel Nicholas and KBW, uh, to talk about the next wave of M&A, uh, what are the implications for consolidation, and uh, independent-minded institutions, how they can prepare for this. That's Thursday, March 25th. Uh, at 11 a.m. Invitations for that session uh, will go out on Monday, and we hope you'll be able to join us for that. We believe that this type of engagement, um, not as good as obviously being face-to-face -face with you all, but from our webinar series, the podcast, Financial Intelligence Library section of our website, all enhances the value of membership by providing you with some key information to help you make strategic decisions. Uh, we, um, you'll see on the Financial Intelligence Library, if you haven't had a chance to visit it, there's tons of information there, specifically a lot of hits on the LIBOR SOFA transition. There was an article this morning in the American Banker stating that the Federal Reserve has written to all of the um, supervised firms that uh, this week they're warning that they could face consequences, that's a quote, if they don't transition from LIBOR to SOFA fast enough because it could create safety and soundness risks for themselves in the financial system. So if you haven't heard this from your field examiners, you're, you're from the NCUA to the FDIC and everyone in between, you, you will. Uh, we can help you out uh, in preparing for that transition if you, if you need our help. Um, through the website and member communications, we also report on major events uh, with management and our board of directors are working on. Two weeks ago, it's hard to believe it was two weeks ago, I feel like I was just on the phone with you all, but two weeks ago we talked about the 5% dividend that we paid. Um, we talked about another pathway to dividend income through capital stock for letters of credit, which uh, went into effect earlier this month. Um, and I mentioned the launch of our new uh, mortgage asset program, our MAP program. Uh, if you are in MPF, you have less than two weeks, time's ticking. Uh, the transactions uh, cease on March 19th, and the last day a loan could be funded in MPF is March 26th. Most everybody has uh, has transitioned over, but if you're one of the few who haven't transitioned from MPF to MAP, we urge you to urge you to do so um, as soon as you can. This week, just a couple, two quickies. Um, one is uh, last week we made two, an extra two million dollars in our small business recovery grant program available for members. It was gone in five minutes, uh, so we appreciate uh, that kind of a, uh, interest and engagement to help support your. <coughs> small business, nonprofits, tribal areas, and um, uh, there is a, a waiting list, as you might imagine, and uh, we're going to do our best to see what the availability is for excess funds uh, as the year progresses, but uh, we do appreciate everyone who's uh, supporting us in our efforts to support your local district. Um, also, very important reminder, earlier this month, we sent out a notice about replacing your RSA devices. For those of you who transact wires or use our OneLink system, all the RSA devices will expire at the end of the month. So you have to get a new one. Uh, and uh, we are encouraging people to do soft tokens, but if you do like your hard token, we'll make sure that's available for you. Um, please contact your calling officer. Uh, someone from our security team should be in touch with you, but if you haven't heard from them yet, <clears throat> please reach out to your calling officer and we'll, we'll take care of that with you right away because <clears throat> we do want you to, of course, have access to the bank. Okay, uh, with that out of the way, let's uh, focus on today's webinar. Uh, just a couple uh, pointers. Um, if you have questions, please submit them at any time through the question box, and we'll answer them at the end of the session. We're always looking forward to enhancing the program with our members, so we ask you to complete the survey at the end of today's webinar. Uh, and to introduce uh, today's speaker and, and, quote, old friend of mine, uh, not that he is, seasoned, I mean. I've known Frank for, geez, I think when I started in 96. So he's a, he's a wonderful friend of the home loan bank system. Tom's going to give him the introduction. So Tom Satino, our vice president, director of member relations. Uh, let's uh, introduce Frank. Thanks, Tom. All right. Thanks, Adam. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. I uh, really appreciate you attending uh, this session. It's going to be a great session. 
Um, Frank Ferrone, our Managing Director of Darling Consulting, will be uh, presenting on the balance sheet strategies with 2020 hindsight. Um, Frank and I have uh, known each other for 10 years. When I started, the day I interviewed, actually, I, I met Frank uh, at, at the Home Loan Bank. We've been friends ever since, so that's been 10 years. We often talk about uh, balance sheet strategies. As a matter of fact, several times a week, though, we uh, talk about balance sheet strategies, and um, he's really a wealth of knowledge to me and, and the Home Loan Bank. Um, Frank is a frequent speaker on, on the circuit. He speaks a lot at a lot of the trades um, organizations in, in New York and New Jersey uh, for both banks and credit unions, but also uh, nationwide. And he also uh, speaks and works with a lot of the other home loan banks as well. Um, Frank is, like I mentioned, he's a real expert in uh, funding, uh, balance sheet management, uh, modeling. Uh, so he, he's a real wealth of knowledge. Um, after this uh, session, if you uh, wanted to uh, get in touch with Frank. His uh, email is on the back of the presentation. Uh, we encourage you to do so. He's, uh, he's great uh, like that. He'll just answer your questions and give you some insight. Uh, no, no problem. Um, so uh, Frank is really open to that. Um, so uh, with that, Frank, uh, I'm really looking forward to this session. And the one last thing, I just wanted to comment on something that Adam said on the RSA devices. Um, some folks uh, um, are unfamiliar with the uh, soft token, hard token uh, terminology. The hard token is a, uh, a physical uh, uh, device uh, that you use that you get a code for logging into the uh, OneLink system. And the soft token is something that you download uh, onto your, uh, onto your uh, smartphone. Uh, it's an app and then, then it could generate the code. So I just wanted to uh, mention that because there was some confusion uh, regarding that. So with that, Frank, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Great. Um, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Adam. And uh, welcome, everybody. You know, wh when when I put this this presentation together and I came up with this title, it's kind of a play on words, right? Balance sheet strategies with 2020 hindsight. What does that mean? Well, it, it's a it's a two for one, right? Number one is you know 2020 hindsight. We all wish we had 2020 hindsight, right? But we don't. But I think there are some things that we can learn from looking at data and looking at historical patterns and trends and behaviors, et cetera. So I'm gonna kind of sprinkle that stuff in. We've got, uh, we've got data scientists here that are uh, very, very, very bright people and they work very diligently to come up with a lot of this information. And so I'm gonna share with you some of that information that they've come up with. And it's what we call predictive analytics and it's pretty darn good and i'm going to share that with you today the other way you can look at the balance sheet strategies with 2020 hindsight is to look back at 2020 and ask ourselves what did we learn and i'm going to share some of those experiences with you as well uh, manage margin and earnings pressure is an intensifying prepare for the inevitable well the inevitable is those margins and earnings are going to continue to come under pressure all throughout 2021. And I think the question on everybody's mind is, what do we do? And I'm going to try to uh, provide for you supporting information as to why I believe you should be almost a net buyer of funds today, but certainly not swimming in cash because of this low rate environment. That's number one. Number two, what do we anticipate deposits are going to look like three months, six months, a year, 18 months, two years forward? I'm going to provide my what, forecast or prediction, once again, based on predictive analytics. And so if, if we can offset some of the pressures that we're dealing with today by just using information, um, to make better decision, it's mission accomplished. And that's, that's my objective today. And so one of the things that, and by the way, it was a year ago today, one year ago today, when they announced this officially pandemic, right? That we, we, we've all, you know, it's changed our lives. It's changed the world forever, right? And so here we are, and the good news is, and it's a moment, you know, most of us will never forget. And that is when, when the Pfizer CEO came out and said, you know, 
we, we have a vaccine that's 90% effective. So as Adam said, the skies are opening up, the skies are clearing. It's a beautiful day in New York, right? And, you know, we've survived a lot, right, as New Yorkers, and I'm a, I'm a New Yorker. And so we're going to survive this too. And so let's take advantage of the opportunities that are in front of us. And there are plenty. And so that's, that's kind of what I hope to do today. And, you know, we've had the vaccine, right? Uh, margins are coming down. The question is, what do we do? And we have never been so busy. I have never been so busy um, than we have been over the last several months from folks like yourself that have finally come to the conclusion that we just don't know which way to turn because of all the anomalies, all the uncertainties um, that's going on right now. And so if I were to ask you, how comfortable are you with your current interest rate risk position? How about your liquidity risk? How about capital? Capital is coming under pressure, right? I think right now, and once again, things are looking pretty good, uh, particularly on the credit side. And again, we 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 you know we're dealing with 600 plus banks and credit unions, coast to coast, everywhere in between. We have lots of data, and I'm going to share that data with you. That hopefully will give you some comfort to take action while we're down in this in this low rate environment. And you know, if you've heard me, I sound like a broken record. Right? And this is important right up front to set the stage, and that is the role of ALCO. Right? And I'm going to provide you with a list of questions in the next couple of slides that I want you to take back to ALCO and, and ask the group. You know, are we asking ourselves all these questions? Because if your ALCOs aren't different today, then they should be. There's a lot of questions. There's a lot of uncertainty. And we're going to get to the bottom of that. Right? And ultimately, at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we've got good information going into the model, and I'm going to share some of that, some of those assumptions and data that we think is important to go into the model because things are different today, right? Um, how do we get the right picture of our interest rate risk profile? Look at this. Look at this picture at the bottom of the page, right? On the left side, this is where we are at the end of the year, 12/31/2020. Well, you know, if rates go sideways and we don't grow. It's not so bad, but we've got lower levels of income. If rates go up 2%, life is good. Here's the problem. The probability of rates going up like that anytime soon is like me, what? Growing curly hair, right? Pretty low probability. If we look at where we were a year ago, we've got lower levels of earnings. So the good news is we've outpaced that with growth. But what happened to our interest rate risk position? We used to be exposed to rising rates. And we benefited when rates fell, right? Now we benefit if rates rise. What happened? Did our business model change? No. It's the flood of non-maturity deposits that came pouring, pouring in. And I'll take a quote from Adam Goldstein, right? Uh, a year ago, right? Uh, I, I think the expression was, you know what? Um, you know, be, be, be careful. Uh, you know, a lot of us were worried about um, funding costs. And we wanted to get some relief from that funding cost, hoping rates would fall. But if you're going to be prepared, if you're going to pray for rain, you better be prepared for the mud that comes along with it. So, um, uh, and then asking good questions leads to better answers. And right now, when we look at our interest rate risk, our liquidity risk, um, all of the things that we do from an asset liability management perspective, everything looks different. And it's because what I call the balance sheet within the balance sheet. And I'll give you an example in a minute to show you how things have changed. And this is just one example. And I'm going to use this same bank right here all throughout my presentation, right? Here are the questions that ALCO should be asking. And I'm not going to go through every single one of these. I'm going to go through these as we go through the presentation. I would encourage you, print this out, take this out, bring it to your next ALCO meeting. Because these are the questions I think will lead to more effective strategy discussion. So to set the stage, what are the things that everybody is struggling with? Margin, margin compression, earnings compression, that will continue almost regardless of what you do. We can help it, but we can't necessarily stop it. Cash is accumulating, and you'll notice I have more to come with an exclamation. It's not a question. It's coming. It will continue to come in my humble opinion, and I'll share with you why I believe that is true. So if you think you've got a challenge getting cash out today, this excess deposits, whatever we define as excess, 
And the question becomes, what do we do with that? We're going to talk about that. What, what do we expect in terms of the pal- deposit balances moving forward? Predicting what is expected to happen moving forward is impossible. But I think we've got some information and some data that I think will help help you know answer some of your some of your questions. Right? Loan growth. We're going to talk about you know what's getting in the way of growing loans. Mortgage activity is starting to slow down. Right? And and the skies are starting to clear. And you know what? Um, you know, bankers use that in, in the form of, you know, in the banking world, right? Um, I think most most banking lenders now are a lot more comfortable making loans today than they were uh, just a few months ago, right? And so that's going to continue to put pressure on rates and margins uh, when it comes to growing loans. If, if I'm going to show you a little later on, there's a pretty steep uh, yield curve that has materialized over the last week or so. Um, Let's take advantage of it before it disappears. And it's already starting to back off a little bit. But one of the things you notice is as that long end of the curve has come up, pricing is lagging, right? We don't see any change, any change, right, Uh, in, in loan pricing as a result. And so if you've got a loan pricing model that's building in all of these variables, including the shape of the curve, like the swap curve, and all of a sudden you're, you're, you're mispricing loans, you're not getting any new loan demand, you know what? We're going to talk about that. We are going to talk about that as well. Ten-year treasury was up to 163 when I put this presentation together. I think it's an opportunity. And if short-term interest rates remain low, that has implications for deposit pricing, loan pricing, and what we do with all of this quote unquote, excess cash. And then I talked about the balance sheet within balance sheet. There are hidden risks, but there's also some great opportunities. And we're going to uncover those as we go through the presentation. Credit, um, we, you know, we look at a lot of institutions across the country. And you know what? Things are a lot better than we had perhaps anticipated. Right, and we subscribe to Oxford Economics, and these are updated every single quarter. And and um, those of you that you know have run credit stress tests with us, you, you know you, you see that when we look at the cross section of everyone that we deal with, things look pretty good. Knock mm-hmm. on knock on wood. But capital also remains a focus. There, by the way, there's a new program through the Treasury. If you are a, um, a low income. Um, or in the banking world, it's a CDFI, uh, whatever it is, you can actually ask access capital now, anywhere between half a point and 2%, right? And if you don't know anything about that, uh, look it up or send me an email and I'll help you. I'm already helping a bunch of folks just kind of model out what the expectation is if we get this capital. Okay, so that's setting the stage. Here's the balance sheet within the balance sheet, using that same example. If we were to look at um, what was the impact of COVID? year over year. I just pulled this out of an ALCO package for this client, right? It continues. Our investments are up $616 million. Where did all that come from? Well, it all came from here. All this non-maturity deposit growth, $458 million. That's a lot of growth, 23%. The average is about 16 to 17%. The average growth in non-maturity deposits, okay? So they're a little bit higher than, than normal, right? The big question is, how long is this stuff going to stick around? I'm going to share that with you. Let's look at the loan side. What's happening here? Our loans are down $50 million as of 1231. I can tell you, um, be- between September and December, right, they were down $127 million. Down $127 million. So it's going down quickly. And so the question becomes, why are we losing all these loans? It's a function of comfort level of holding long assets and pricing. And so the last meeting I had, which was just a couple of weeks ago, we, we turned this thing around and I'm gonna show you why. And I'm sure these are same same things that you go through at Alco. So what's going on in 2021? Biggest pressure, b- biggest issue is it's margin pressure. Um, and so the question becomes, you know, asset sensitivity is growing. For some of you that are liability sensitive, what you found, I'm sure is all of a sudden, we're not, we're not exposed to rising rates anymore. We do better as rates rise. Aha. Yeah, but the question becomes, are you really? Are you really? So I call this the hole. 
if we look at our run rate of income in this base case bar graph, it's going down, 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 down. How do we fill this hole? And those are the things that you have to ask yourself. How much room do we have to lower our deposit rates? I would submit that most of you haven't brought your deposit rates down far enough. I see it all the time. And I'm going to show you where and why um, you've got room. That's number one. Number two, should we extend all this excess liquidity that we've got sitting in? Should we buy loans, or invest in loans, or should we go out on the investment curve? You know, if you remember last, yeah, last summer, right? I, I wrote. I just happened to be my time to write an article for DCG, and I wrote an article about. Um, all of the excess liquidity that we're holding, what do we do? There are three simple things that you do, step by step by step, the last of which is buying investments. The 10-year treasury was at 50 basis points. We talked about other things to do first. If you want a copy of that, um, send me an email. And I think it still makes sense. Now, now where we are in the rate cycle, it's like, let's go. We've got to get out on the curve. There's huge opportunities now. Everything's at a discount. I can buy mortgage backs at discounts. I can buy dust bonds at discounts. I can buy agencies. I can buy everything at a discount, and I've got a significantly higher yield. Now, the tiebreaker is simple, to go out on the curve. I'll share some of those ideas with you as well. What, what are the implications? And again, I'm just trying to think about what are the things that are on your mind, right? What are the implications if I extend cash in this low rate environment? W what happens if, right? We'll talk about that. And when, when interest rates do go up, Right? How's that going to impact my risk profile? Is all this money going to leave and I'm going to have to replace it with higher cost funding or, or, or God forbid, right? Wholesale funding, right? We're going to talk about that. So, one thing that I think is important to understand, and, and if you've heard me before, you've heard me say this a, a, a thousand times, right? Long term interest rates move ahead of short rates. Therefore, if you believe, and we're experiencing this right now, right today. The 10-year treasury is up to you know, the 160 from as low as 150. Fed funds hasn't moved. Long rates anticipate a stronger economy. Things are recovering, and then short rates follow. If you believe that the, the Fed is going to stay on hold for at least the next two years, then let's take a look at a more reasonable, plausible, I call it, scenario. And that is... Let's look on the right side of the page. If the Fed doesn't move for the next two years, and then they slowly start to bring rates up 2%, long rates move up first, short rates follow. This is what we're looking at right here. This is what we're looking at. If, if we look like this over here, well, rates go up starting tomorrow. Uh, you know what? We don't have that much of a hole before things start to re recover, right? This is where I'm going to focus my efforts on a delayed rate scenario before the Fed starts to move and this, the curve starts to steepen. That's a pretty big hole that we need to fill, right? And that's probably a scenario that I would encourage you to focus on more than, you know, rates going up sooner rather than later or rate shocks. I see alpha packages all the time, rate shocks, right? Uh, uh, we, we run them, but I don't even focus on them. So here's our focus today. We're going to quantify the surge and I'm going to, I'm going to submit that these, these deposits are going to stay around for a while, and they're going to continue to grow. And if that is true, and you're comfortable with that, what do we do? Pricing trends. I'm going to show you something that maybe I never really thought about, right? And it's something I hadn't thought about until the data scientists showed us. And that is, you know, we think that we price short-term deposits off the short end of the curve, not this time around. It's the long end of the curve that's driving these short-term interest rates down because margins are coming under pressure as our loans, and we've done everything we can on the CD side, and now we've got to look to the non-maturity deposit. If your deposits on the short end of the curve, non-maturities, are not below where they were in 15, they should be, and I'll show you why. And then what are the risk management implications of what we think is going to be a, a, a reasonable, rational uh, outlook, right, for, for deposits and, and rates? And then what do we do? So that's, that's today's focus, right? Deposit surge, right? What do we do? Here's our story today. No surprise, right? This is, you know, if, if you just look at before pre-COVID, right? What, what, did, what did we look like, right, before this big surge in non-maturity deposits, right? And then if we look out on the horizon, right, where do we expect this to go? One of the things I want you to think about, 
and this is very important, is let's just normalize the growth rate of non-maturity deposits in a low rate environment, which if you think about where we were, um, and if we just normalize that growth and we, we continue that outward, I'm going to show you in a minute that even if this COVID surge starts to taper off and these things start to pay down, we're going to have the same level of balance as 18 months forward as we have today. And again, this is all driven by the data scientists that, uh, that, that we work with. Okay, tracking this COVID era deposits. What have we learned since, right? We've got uh, over 2 billion, over 2 billion um, accounts that we look at over a 20-year time horizon, um, thousands of banks over every state in the country. And that's where a lot of this information comes from. So once again, if you don't have this information on your own, right, use this as a, a, a surrogate. So what have we learned? Of all these deposits, right, that came pouring in, we had this unexpected surge in April of 6.6, .6, and it's continued to grow right till today. New account openings, right? A lot of those that came in, they're, they're paying off more quickly. A lot of that's business accounts. What we found is um, most of the deposits, most of our deposit accounts have doubled. And so when we look at those accounts that have more than doubled, that makes up about 75% of that growth. Right. And if if we just look at normal levels of decay over time, our expectation is the dominant share of all of this growth that's come in since that surge is likely to remain and stay permanent on a balance from a balanced perspective. So if you believe that to be true, that should hopefully give you the intestinal fortitude of maybe putting some of that cash out today assuming we stay in this low rate environment. And so three steps to tell your story, whether it's internally at Alco, to the board, to regulators, is number one, quantify that surge like I just walked you through. And by the way, if you, if you wanna listen in to this group of data scientists that work here, um, uh, there is a presentation they did, it's about an hour long, that walks you through all this in great detail. I'll make that available to you. But at the end of the day, simplistically, separate, right? New accounts versus existing accounts. I walked you through that. PPP, assume that comes and it's gone, right? Um, estimate your forecast moving forward. And I'm going to show you that in a, in a second. That's the balance sheet within the balance sheet, right? What's likely to stick around? And then we always want to stress test and assume that we're wrong. And even if we're wrong, right? If I take these surge deposits and run off 100% of them, are we still okay? The answer is, in my opinion, the answer is yes. And then obviously tracking vintage. I just showed you a little example of that before of when the money comes in and when it's, when it's, when it's moving out. So here is the, the surge that we saw in April. Balance has moved up quickly. And since that time, it's continued to move up. Not telling you anything you don't know. The question becomes, how long is this going to keep going up before it starts to decay or run out? I think that's everybody's question. So one of the things I would do is I would just put together, right? Let, let's take a look at, by the way, when do rates typically start to migrate out? When the economy is strong, when rates are rising, and the Fed starts to raise. How do I know? I look historically, right, to give me some predictive behavior. And so what I'm suggesting here is if interest rates start to rise, and I'm going to say, let's say rates go up 200, right? I'm going to show you the runoff from June. I'm going to start the rate increase June of this year, right? All the way out to 1231.22. That's my timeline here. Your normalized rate of non-maturity deposit growth, right, is enough to, to stem the tide of all this COVID surge running out the back door. Here's your estimates. You can plug all these numbers in if you have the tool. If you don't, call me. I'll run it for you, right? And I'm assuming that um, the remaining surge balance is runoff is 75%. We'll see. That's our, that is our forecast. That's our estimate, right? And those are very important considerations. And if I told you with certainty this is going to happen, would it influence your behavior? Would it influence the things that you do?
And let's assume we're off. Let's assume we're wrong. How, how much could we be off and how badly would it hurt us? Those are the things that you need to ask yourself. And I'm going to give you an example to, uh, in a few minutes of, of this client that I showed you earlier. And we put the cash out. We're getting all the cash out. And I'm going to assume that 100%, 100% of the surge deposit runs out the door. And you know what? They still look pretty darn good. And I had the board of directors in the room. Well, not all of them, but many of them. Senior management. And we actually had a, made a huge decision to do something that you know, they currently weren't doing because of all of the concerns that we're talking about this morning. And I'm sure we all have the same concerns. How about on the pricing side? You know, we all know that when interest rates go up, right, we have to change our deposit rates. And if you haven't tracked your deposits and how you might price those and what the decay rates are and all that stuff, I have it. Two, over 2 billion of accounts. And you know what? Um, I'll give you that information, right, if you don't have it yourself. A lot of numbers on this page. I want you to focus on um, a, a couple of numbers here. Number one, this, this again, this is cross-institution analytics. What does that mean? That means this is all of the clients that we work with um, and the data that we've put together, and here's what we've come up with. Number one, what's the average rate on CDs, non-maturities? now accounts, savings accounts, and then for the credit union share drafts regular side, here's the average rate. Let's take a look at the, the lowest rate payers, the bottom, bottom 20th percentile versus the 80th percentile. You can look at the numbers. Look at the difference. That's a pretty significant difference in terms of what, what institutions are paying. And one thing I can tell you is it doesn't matter if you pay 10 or you pay 40, it's not influencing the behavior of the majority of your depositors or members. Some of the clients that we work with that pay the least amount of money, right? Their deposits are growing the quickest. Quickest. Those that pay some of the highest, they're not seeing any additional growth above and beyond what we're seeing in other institutions, right? And I'm going to submit to you that you've got more room to bring down your non-maturity deposits, which is going to make a big difference, by the way. So if you just want to look at historically. How have non-maturity deposits behaved? How money markets behaved? You, you can use this. This is my client here, um, uh, and what they're and what they're paying, right? Uh, or, or I should. This is our, you know, the, the current rates here, right? And then what I did is I said, look, you know, we can bring these rates down, and you're not going to experience any outfall. And if ever there was a time to test the elasticity of your deposit base, now is the time, because nobody cares. Right or very few. You might have an occasional one. Right. Look at the changes year over year. Look at the changes in your funding costs. What do you notice? Right. Oh, and by the way, if if we look back a year ago, if you look at when Fed funds was two and a quarter, right. And all I do is I look at my current deposit rates and say, if rates were to go up 200, where would we price our non-maturity deposits? What would the betas be? Well, go back to the rates that you paid. And I think you can even be lower, all right? So predicting pricing. One of the things that uh, regulators sometimes worry about, and maybe everybody worries about, is rising rates, right? Go back to the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the quote that, uh, that Adam gave about, you know, uh, you pray for rain, but you better be prepared for the mud, right? If you think about it, right, you ought to be praying for higher rates. A strong, you know, when rates go up, that's typically a sign of what? Stronger economy, right? Lower levels of unemployment. All good things. Less credit-related issues, right? That's what we ought to be focusing on, not worrying about rates go up and the deposits are going to go out. Heck, I've got the Federal Home Loan Bank to back me up if i got to worry about deposits, right, or, or, or liquidity. So look at Fed funds versus interest-bearing non-material deposits. I would bet you 99% of you here today, that's how you, you measure Right, what you pay and the betas that you pay on on your non-maturity deposits and maybe even your CDs, right? And that's probably okay, but it doesn't hold true today, right? There is a supply-demand dynamic, and again, I, I can't do justice to this like the data scientists 
listen to that webinar. But to better understand our pricing, we've got to look at the relationship between loan pricing and deposit pricing. And to keep this very, very simple, right? Um, right now, when we, when we look at um, interest rates, right? Loan interest income is coming down fast and furiously. And if you look at this, this orange line right here, this line is going to continue to come down. And as that continues to come down, right, that should influence what you pay on your non-maturity deposits. When, when rates hit the all-time low, right, we got the 10-year treasury in the 50 range, right, that was lower than where we were in 2015, despite Fed funds being the same. And yet, a lot of us felt like, well, you know, if we get down to where we were in 2015, same rate level, uh, we should be good. No, long rates are lower. And because they're lower, your non-maturity deposit rates should be lower. And, and, and here right, is just an example. Interest-bearing non-maturity deposit cost. As rates are coming down, right, if we compare, you know, last time to this time, we actually should be, right, below. You should be charging people to keep money with you, all things being equal. Right. If we look at this 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 uh, uh, relationship between long rates and, and short rates. Now, you're not going to do that, although some are almost at at zero. But that's about where we should be. And that's why when I say your non maturity deposit rates should be lower for many of you, they probably should be lower. Right. If, if I were to ask you, when well, rates go up two percent from here, how much are you going to move your non maturity deposit rates? Some of you haven't even moved those betas. And if you just take the assumption in your model today and ask yourself, um, if rates go up to, our beta says we're going to do this, that gets us to this level. How does that compare to where we were when rates were two and a quarter on the short end of the curve? I bet you you're overstating your expense. I bet you. It's... Anyway, so if you want to look at cross-institution, this is what we would expect your betas to look like whether rates go up one or whether rates go up two. You compare that to, and I'll go back, compare that to this right here, and it's almost spot on. Coincidentally, it's not coincidence. Okay. We've gotten through a lot of that. The question now becomes, right? And I've got about seven or eight minutes to get through this, which is all we're going to need. On the lending side, there's always that push-pull, right, between the lenders and, and credit and, and finance. There's that tension. And so one of the things I thought would be helpful, and this, again, is something that I showed to the client the other day when we finally got to the point where now we're going to start taking action that we, we were, were not taking because we were concerned about interest rates, levels, et cetera. If you have a loan, an internal loan pricing model, right, and you plug all these numbers in, you know what you're going to come up with? A loan rate that nobody's going to pay. You've heard me say that before. Look at where we were last August. And this is a derivative sheet. You know, I know some of you want to run down the hall and jump out the window like the lion in the Wizard of Oz because derivative is a bad word. But let's just use this as a pricing sheet. A year ago, well, not even a year ago, almost, right? We go back to August. The 10-year point of the curve, if you want to put on 10-year funding, 39 basis points. If I translate that into how should we be pricing 10-year fixed-rate commercial loans, around 340. So when rates were this low, we were offering 10-year loans out at 340. Fast forward, right? And by the way, some of us wanted to almost throw up when, when 10-year fixed rate commercial real estate loans were at 340 because the relative level of rates back then, even at 375, said, ooh, it doesn't feel comfortable. The reality is spreads actually widened. Right. And so nobody gets these rates. You, you, you just don't get these type of rates. Right. And today, if I look at that same 10 year point of the curve in March, remember I said earlier, right, some bankers and some credit unions, they didn't get the memo. Hey, rates have backed up. That's gone from 39 to one, almost 100 basis points. A 10 year fixed rate commercial loan today amortized over 20 years should be or should be priced at 441 in a lot of our loan models. Right? The reality is you don't get those spreads. You know, you know, if I translate that to a LIBOR-based, you know, in the, in the best of times, right, we were getting 
LIBOR plus 175, LIBOR plus two. We weren't getting these wide spreads. And so, you know, if somebody walks through your door today and wants a 10-year fixed rate commercial real estate loan at, 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 at three, 375, right, uh, and you're not comfortable doing that, then the, the, what's the alternative? Cash at 10? I'm telling you. And you think it's tough now? It's going to probably get worse as more and more bankers are comfortable going out to those levels. And, and let's say it's three and a quarter. Would you do it at three and a quarter, but you wouldn't do it at 375? Does 50 basis points really make a difference? For some of us, it does. For others, it shouldn't. It shouldn't. Uh, and if you want to grow, right, you're, you're going to have to sharpen your pencil. At the end of the day, it's all about credit. Don't worry about the spreads or, or the relative level of, of rates. So, I'm going to walk you through this quickly. This was my client, and I made sure I took out the name to protect the innocent. All we're looking at here is we're looking at um, rate levels, activity, and spreads. And one of the things that you notice here is look, look, look at all the originations we got right back here. And then all of a sudden, loan demand fell off of a cliff. How come? Because rates were falling. And, and our spreads widened because we dug our heels in the ground and we, any loan that we did get, we got pretty good spreads. But here's the problem. Our volume was going down and it continues to come down. And this is the same institution. It's a bank, pretty good sized bank that was losing a lot of loans. Income's going down, right? I can do the same thing on the residential side for this particular bank, right? And you know what? We started holding a lot of 30-year fixed rate mortgages and it's a commercial bank. That's not what they typically do, but that's what we needed to do and we had to do. So spreads are widening, life is good, but volume's coming down. And so the question becomes, why aren't we booking these 10-year fixed rate commercial loans at three and a half? I know you don't like the level. I know you don't like the rate, but you know what? Get used to it. It's not going to get better. And as the economy improves, the vaccine, and you know, we go back to semi-business you know, uh, business as usual, these spreads are not going to widen out. If anything, they're going to tighten. So you've seen me go through this before. How much, how much can we put on in the way? All right, that means I've got eight minutes, okay? So how much can we put on in the way of long-term fixed rate assets? Well, you go through a very simple calculation. Look at how many assets you have on the books beyond five years today. Look at your gap report. Look at your funding that's supporting that. And you know what you're going to find is, in, th in this particular case, we've got a billion two more in long funding than we have in long assets. Therefore, the, the hundreds of millions of dollars sitting in cash, it's long-term money. Get it out with long-term assets. How do we do that? Well, here's what I did. I put on immediately $250 million of commercial real estate loans, 1025 structure at 350. I said, would that get the deal done? And by the way, every loan doesn't have to be 350. Some might be four, some might be three. But let's say 350. Look at the difference in our income. Who cares about the spread? Who cares about the rate? What difference does it make? We've got more income. Look at our interest rate risk profile. We're better off in every single interest rate environment. Yeah, well, Frank, what happens if what happens if the money runs out the door? As soon as we do this, Murphy's Law, okay? Let's do that. How do we look now? We're still better off. We're still better off. And we don't need long funding. We have it in the form of what? Non-maturity core funding. Some of you, I know it's a big question. Money is burning a hole in your pocket. People get a kick out of this, right? The reality is, what's required to move the needle? How much cash do we have to get out before it actually makes a difference? Well, today, it's a lot different than it was when rates were lower because the curve is so much steeper and I can buy at discounts. So what's required to move the needle, right? Prioritize our investment objectives. And what's the tiebreaker here, right? If, if, if I'm waiting for rates to go higher, right, before I finally get the money out on the curve, every day that goes by, I'm sitting at 10 versus 160, 170, or even two now, I can get dust bonds at discounts at two. That's what I ought to be doing, right? There's no free lunch. You've heard me say that a million times. Do your homework. Make sure, make sure that management, ALCO, board, they understand that as rates go up, we lose value and we'll have unrealized loss. HTM versus AFS, whole nother day for discussion on that. Call me if you want to talk about that, if you're thinking about it, but level set the discussions for unrealized losses. And as I say to my clients, the bigger the unrealized loss, the better off we're going to be. When we start seeing gains in those investments that we're buying today, that's not a good sign. That means rates are coming lower. So 
10-year treasury, 163. Buy a discount. Look at the big backup in rates here, right? Re refi activity, it's starting to slow down, right? And if cash is burning a hole in your pocket, you've got a lot better options today. Uh, and keep in mind, deposit costs will lag. And your deposits are likely to grow if you believe, you know, what I showed you earlier. Put the cash to work now and don't look back. Just make sure you document everything. There's a lot of stuff on this, on this page. One thing I want to point out to you, this is a client of mine that I work with, right? And, and one of the things that you notice is rates are coming, uh, if, if rates stay right with our, our earnings are coming down. Every year, he has me run a, a growth scenario. This year, growth scenario, Frank, can you model out $35 million of residential loan growth uh, over 2021? So, sure, I'll run it. And I know that there's a high probability he won't get a quarter of that growth because I go through this every year. So I said to him, you know what? Yeah, we'll model it out for you. That looks great. But look at your earnings. They're going to, they're going to heck in a handbasket here, right? And, and then you have this inflection point over here, right? And there's a lot of weird stuff that's going on. But ask yourself these questions, number one. Number two, what I did for him was I said, you know what I'm going to do? Not only am I going to run that, I'm going to run a scenario where, right, I'm going to go out today and I'm going to buy, right now, I'm going to buy $30 million of bonds. And I'm going to fund it. And this guy loves liquidity, loves liquidity, loves high capital, right? Keeps the regulators at bay, right? I'm not even going to use your money. I'm going to go to the home loan bank. I'm going to borrow a ladder of advances based on my risk profile. You keep all the liquidity you want. Don't worry about the money running out. I'm going to go buy securities today, and I'm going to run this scenario. And what do you notice? In the base case scenario, over the next three years, if rates stay the same, that's a million dollars. Even if rates go up two or delayed, and then they start going, it's almost a million dollars in my pocket. What's the worst that can happen? Worst that can happen is I do this, and then rates rise, and loan demand picks up. That would be a windfall. That would be nirvana, right? Now, there is a 95, 99% chance this strategy will never get executed. I've been working with these people a long time, right? I'll be honest with you. They're not going to do it. But my job is to tell them what they need to know, not what they want to hear, right? And when June rolls around, we're going to have the same discussion. What do we do now, Frank? And I'm going to say, you know, hit the rewind. Go, you know, go back in your time capsule and and – Anyway, capitalize on cheap funding vis-a-vis -vis the home loan bank. So I went through a lot of stuff today. My hope was just to make sure that everybody is comfortable, uh, that number one, you got to get the position right, right? Um, we've got a balance sheet within a balance sheet. Normalize, you know, all of that surge in deposits. Hopefully what I showed you makes sense. Um, key assumptions that go into the model are absolutely critical. In terms of the sensitivity, I think for a lot of us, we're probably being too conservative in our assumptions, showing that we've got more exposure than we, we, might, we might have, right? How rates rise, that matters. If you're running shocks, right, stop it or stop using that to make decisions. Look at a prolonged and protracted low rate environment and then rates gradually going higher. And then how you present this at Alco makes a big difference too. Don't sit at Alco with 100 pages. Uh, and then just talk theoretically about what we do. Model it out. And at the end of the day, like the client I just showed you, I, I feel a little uncomfortable saying it, but I, I know they're not going to do it. And if you don't execute, we just wasted a lot of time, effort, energy. And we're going right back to doing the same thing. It's like going on a diet, right? And then you don't stick to it. So thank you for your time. Um, let's open it up to questions if, if anybody has any questions. Hey, and Frank, how you doing? Plug. This is uh, Tom. Uh, I did have a, I had a question myself, and then we also had another member question. Um, the first question that I had uh, relates to um, adding long-term assets to your balance sheet and security, long-term securities, where you're adding duration to your um, to your assets. Uh, how do you get? Um, how do CFOs get their alcos comfortable? Because they they often um, get pushback from their alcos when they when they take this strategy, because you're going to be experiencing some unrealized losses as, as rates rise and how, and, how, and its associated impact to economic value of equity or NEV if you're a credit union. Okay, good question, good question, right? And I'm glad you asked that question. Why? Because you know what that tells me? You're not taking action on what's in the best interest of the, of the organization, right, um, because you're worried about rising rates. And 
unrealized losses, right? So, so you know, implicit, implicit in that question or implicit in the decision not to go out on the curve is there's a bias. There is a bias that says, you know what? I would rather stay down here and wait and hope that things get better than make a decision today that somebody's going to point the finger at me, right? Number one, unrealized losses, right? And this is probably the one time where I think Eve or NEV might be helpful. Uh, and that is, you know, look at your economic value of equity calculation, or NEV. Look at the up one, up two, up three shock scenario. Where you lose value on the asset side, you, you more than make up on the liability side in terms of gains. You know what, theoretically, and I just went through this with a client, we're looking at some branches to buy, right? So I kind of helped them price out, you know, what I think was a reasonable cost for, the, for, for these branches, right? And theoretically, every deposit, every deposit in that balance sheet, in these branches, they should be paying us to take, right? Because I can borrow money at the home loan bank cheaper than the cost of, of bringing on these deposits, which means what? These deposits, which is really your franchise, are a lot more valuable when rates are higher, right? And yet, w w we don't take advantage of uh, the, the, the long-term nature, low cost of these funds. I showed you how these, these prices move over time, and you might get a little bit of variance in terms of decay rate and average life for your non-maturity deposits as rates go up, right? And I have that slide I'll show you, right, if anybody wants it. Um, don't be afraid of rising rates. Rising rates is your friend. Don't focus on unrealized loss. Focus on income, levels of income, right? And once again, if you're worried about unrealized losses, think about the, the, the real losses we have today, the opportunity cost of doing nothing and sitting and waiting and hoping. That, that's my response to that. And go back to that core funding utilization. And then run alternatives like I just showed you. Take what I just gave you and present it to your ALCO and senior management. Or you want me to do it, I'll do it. Call me. I'll be happy to sit with your board or your outgo. Happy to do that. Any other questions? I, I, I'm looking about yeah, 20 Yeah, thanks, Frank. We're, we're running, a little, running a little short on time, but we do have a, have a question or two. Um, this one's interesting. What, uh, what do you think about prepaying liabilities uh, to deploy excess cash uh, if, if we're uncertain about deploying excess cash out on the curve in investments? Okay. So, so if if you have excess cash that's, that's sitting in Fed funds at 10, and I've got a, I'll call it a borrowing on the book that's cost me one and a half or two, well, I don't need this borrowing anymore. Why don't I just pay it off? I'm sitting in cash. Well, if you do that, right, um, that's going to cost you, right? So that doesn't add to your income. It subtracts from your income. If, if you have a longer-term funding source, that's above market rate today, what, and it's sitting in cash, why not take it and go out on the curve and make a spread on it? Now, instead of dipping into my pocket and taking a hit, I actually make money on the deal. Just blend that into your overall funding. Don't, don't look at individual silos of assets and liabilities. Look at it holistically and say, that's just a part of my overall funding, and I'm going to use that to go out on the curve, right? Uh, and I'm happy to talk to that person more specifically about how you get Alco to take action and do some of these things. But no, the last thing I would do in 99.999% of cases is ever prepay a federal loan bank advance. It, it just never makes sense unless unless your capital is you know under pressure, which most people aren't right now. Okay, thanks, Frank. And uh, one last uh, one last question: uh, What are some of your final thoughts with respect to? Um, our members' wholesale funding policies. Do you have any recommendations uh, for, for changing wholesale funding policies in this environment? Uh, yes. I, I always have an opinion, Tom, on anything. So, um, so whoever is asking that question, you know, probably hasn't heard me, you know, in, in some of my prior presentations because I, I usually bring this up every single, almost every single time. And that is, when it comes time to liquidity policies, wholesale policies, give yourself the maximum, maximum, maximum flexibility. Don't have self-imposed things that handcuff you. And so I have clients that have 50% um, limit on funding. By the way, if you're a credit union, what is the limit? What is the regulatory limit? 50%, right? Let's just start with that. I have clients that have 50% um, guidelines. I have some of them at 40%. Um, and I, I can also share with you, um, I, I had a bank that I worked with that just, just got acquired, right? By, uh, by by People's Bank, and then they they this bank just got 
bought out by M&T. Uh, people just uh, last last week it was announced, right? And that's in your neck of the woods, right? They they had over 40% wholesale funding, and and they used to get a one a one in liquidity with 40% wholesale funding. I, I was a little surprised. So how is it they can they can have 40% wholesale funding and get a one in liquidity, right? And if you do go up to 40, don't expect a one. It is, but what's the difference? And some of you have 10%. Where did 10% come from? It's it's the process you have. It's how you manage it. Your contingency liquidity plan. And and if you have a good process in place and good contingency liquidity plan in place, you know the number is almost irrelevant if you can manage it. So um, I, I would give myself the maximum flexibility, right? I wouldn't restrict myself to anything below 30 to 35%. Okay. Um Fantastic. Thanks, Frank. Uh, we're running out of time, so that, that will conclude uh, this session. We really appreciate uh, you presenting for us today, as always, uh, some great information. I um, just want to let everyone know a reminder. Adam already mentioned it. We, we're going to have a speaker uh, on the next session, March 25th. It's going to be covering the next wave of M&A, and that will be Ben Pluck, and uh, he's an executive vice president at Stiefel and KBW. So we're really looking forward to that session. So uh, that invitation will be going out uh, next week. So thank you, everyone, for uh, attending this session. And uh, that, that includes this presentation, and we'll see you next time. Thanks again, Frank. My pleasure. Thanks, gang. Okay, bye-bye.